The visual effects of 2004's Dr. Octopus struck the perfect blend of both CGI and practical effects, because his murderous tentacle appendages were actually brought to life via this highly unorthodox combination of these genuine practical puppets, which were then masterfully enhanced with CGI overlays to achieve this balance of both consistent visual quality and impossible comic book moments that very few superhero films have ever managed to live up to since. And this was all because director Sam Raimi wanted to do something a little different with Doc Ock and not just have him be another generic villain of the week like we so often get nowadays but instead use him as this avenue to tell a timeless and universal story. So that's why in this video we're going to cover how exactly they even did these arms practically, how this made the entire story of Spider-Man 2 even remotely possible and why after almost 20 years of VFX development between Spider-Man 2 and Doc Ock's return in No Way Home do his arms look about the same, if not maybe worse. So arm yourself as we use all of this to answer why the visual effects of Dr. Octopus have aged so flawlessly. So why were these arms done practically? I mean, 2004's CGI wasn't amazing or anything, but it probably could have done this for an entire film. Well, from both a character and a visual effects perspective, the thing that made Doc Ock stand out from any other villains is that he's not just one singular character. Because at the core of Otto's story, and the thing that makes him such a fantastic villain, is this tragic tale of corruption that comes along with him, where he initially sets out to give free energy to the the entire world, but along the way gets warped and twisted by these four mechanical arms that drag him down into a life of crime. And so, to bring this whole corruption story to life, they not only needed performances from Dr. Octopus's actor, Alfred Molina, but also these four mechanical arms that were fused to his spine needed to be manifested as their own complete characters as well, essentially taking on the role of Alfred Molina's co-stars and having to perform alongside him by emoting everything from anger to submission to manipulation. Because for them to be these corruptors of Otto, they had to be fully personified as their own separate entities so that they could independently slither around Otto's back and whisper their poison directly into his mind. And so if you look at this objectively, this is a rather tall order to fill both narratively and visually on screen when you consider that half of Dr. Octopus's character is coming from these completely fake things. Because these things can't even talk, so this whole corruption narrative would have to be manifested completely via how they physically moved on the screen and how they interacted with Otto. And so this is where the use of practical puppets became this incredibly good decision. Because typically, if you were going to make a fake character out of CGI and you wanted them to feel authentic, then what you generally do is record a real actor in one of those really unflattering grey suits that digitally capture their motion and performance for you, because this way a talented actor can lend their skills to you and give you this really realistic baseline for your CGI character's performance. But obviously, in real life, there's nothing that you could use as a motion capture stand-in for any of these giant robot tentacles. And so without this, poor old Alfred Molina would just have to imagine the CGI he'd be acting against. And this would have made it so much harder for him to craft this genuinely powerful emotive performance that makes up like half the soul of this film because there'd just be nothing for him to work with. And so by choosing to have these genuine prop arms there on set, not only did it mean a massive reduction in the amount of VFX work this film needed, but it also meant that Alfred Molina could build this genuine on-screen relationship with them in the exact same way that actors typically would do by improvising and bouncing off one another, whilst also building up this whole visual language between each other to create those really nice natural character moments in a way that would be genuinely impossible to do if he was just guessing what digital thing would be added in there later. Because on top of all of this, having those arms there for real also meant that Sam Raimi was able to direct these arms as if they were a real actor as well, and refine down all of those little visual cues that actors and filmmakers tend to work on, like on-screen power dynamics or who is framed in what way to subtly tell which part of the story, and basically with this, really take control over just how this deteriorating relationship between Otto and his arms was portrayed on screen, so that between him, Alfred Molina, and the efforts of a lot of others on set, who I'll get to in just a second, he would be able to tell the exact story he wanted. 
However, as fantastic as this all sounds, I don't want to give the impression that people who choose to use CGI are just lazy and that practical effects are this amazing, perfect thing. Because this choice to use real arms wasn't just a simple one that came with no strings attached. You get it? Strings? Because they're puppets? Shut up, Dallas. You're not that funny. Because to do this practically, they had to strap four genuine giant prop arms to Alfred Molina's back using this custom harness thing here. And then up to 16 puppeteers on the set would have to move them around and perfectly control them to feel like they were this mix of both a natural extension of Otto that was directly wired into his brain and at the same time also feel like they have this dangerous level of autonomy to them where they could just grab you and crush you in an instant. And so basically to get these arms to work properly it just required insane dedication from both Alfred Molina and the puppeteers and everyone else involved in them. As the timings of all of these little movements had to be meticulously planned so that all 17 of them were in sync and they all flowed correctly into one another with no mistakes. And so the way they managed to pull off this nightmare task was by basically starting development on these arms well before the film's script was even remotely finalised and then taking two years to iron out all of these details down to the tiny little things that you'd never think about like how Otto's weight should be distributed as he stomps around on these arms or making sure that these claws were actually strong enough to pick stuff up or building this weird custom control chair thing here so that one puppeteer could use all four of his limbs to control how the head of this tentacle would emote. Basically, in short, the effort here was just immense and it was a genuinely fantastic achievement by everyone involved that they managed to bring these arms to life so well. And so beyond just looking really good on screen, the thing that made this blend of a real actor, prop arms, and then final CGI enhancement, which we'll get to in just a second, so powerful is the freedom that it enabled the filmmakers to have and how that freedom is basically what made the entire story of Spider-Man 2 possible. Because usually when you do have a highly CGI character, they're really bloody expensive to have on screen. And so often you don't see that much of them, causing things like dialogue scenes scenes and fight scenes to be awkwardly edited around limiting that character's screen time and therefore reducing the amount of VFX work that has to go into them. And a great example of this is how in the Transformers films, the Transformers themselves are actually barely in it because it's much cheaper to just have Shia LaBeouf run around and be an arsehole to people than it is to have giant robots shooting at each other. But with also being this human character who was then enhanced with mostly real props, it meant that the filmmakers basically had no limit on how much they could utilize him throughout this film. And so because of this, the film could actually take its time to craft these extensive dialogue scenes and build this relationship between Otto and all of these other characters and therefore make his arc so much more effective as we get to see him from all of these different angles and truly flesh out how this charming scientist father figure could so easily be destroyed by something so innocent. And this just adds so many layers to the narrative. Whereas if you compare that to Transformers, what do we really know about any of them? That Optimus Prime is stoic and a psychopath? That's all you really get from like six movies worth of his CGI character. And I'm sure they'd love to flesh out their characters and give each of them more screen time, but they just can't do that without the film having some insane budget where they could show them all the time. But now, despite just bigging up how practical and incredible these arms are, still none of this would have been possible without CGI because there's CGI all over this and you barely notice. And so it would be very disingenuous of us to not give this side of the character a fair representation as well. And so typically for the mid and close up shots of Otto, the prop arms would tend to be what was used. But for the wider or more complex shots, like a lot of the combat scenes or where the arms had to spool out from his back, CGI could instead be leveraged as this very effective tool to create these impossible comic book moments. And yeah sure, there are some shots where it does look a little bit bad, but there were other shots where the practical arms would go off the screen and then curve back in as CGI and you'd never be able to tell the difference between the two. So how was it that they managed to get these CGI arms to look so good when other 2004 CGI was um not so good? Well this right here is why I made the claim that this film has the perfect blend of both practical effects and CGI. Because what this film did right was use CGI in exactly the right places where it could be used to look as good as it possibly can. 
But just before we get to that, speaking of supervillains, let's take a look at the real evil of the world, media bias. Because more and more often nowadays, it's algorithms on social media that dictate which news we see in our daily lives. But who's controlling these algorithms? Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, or any other of the billionaires who are just getting richer and richer off controlling what we see and spend our money on? I mean, Jeff Bezos just dethroned Elon Musk as the richest person on earth again. And not too long before that, a study found that we could see the world's first trillionaire within the next decade. And so if you go to ground.news slash CGY, you can see a breakdown of over 240 articles covering this topic, including the study itself, and see which articles are reporting on this, who owns them, and whether these articles have any political bias or a history of being reliable, meaning that you can very quickly determine whether or not what you're reading has some kind of agenda behind it. So for example, we can see that 67% of articles come from highly reliable sources. This one here chooses to highlight how billionaires like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk are causing what Oxfam describes as an inequality crisis, whereas this article from the Washington Post, which as you can see is owned by Jeff Bezos, instead decided to describe this as a decade of division. And so if you don't already know, what today's sponsor, Ground News, actually does is gather related articles from around the world on any topic and then make their reporting completely transparent by providing you with all the context you need to help make an informed decision about what you read. And so I genuinely think Ground News is offering a game-changing service that's more and more needed nowadays. And they're actually completely independent and supported by their subscribers to stay as non-partisan and as factual as possible. So by using my link, ground.news slash CGY, you can get 30% off their unlimited access vantage plan for just around $5 a month. And by subscribing, you'll support the development of their new features like this election page here, which is dedicated to making politics a whole lot easier to understand, especially during an election year. So to check this out, please click the link down below or scan the QR code. And thank you for Ground News for sponsoring this video. And now back to the video and back to how they use their CGI in exactly the right places. And so a great example of this is how typically stuff like interactions between a human actor and CGI can usually be really, really hard to get looking right. And so that's often why you see those really weird and amusing behind the scenes videos with the guys in the green costumes. Because what they're trying to do here is fake this whole CGI and and reality interaction process. And so you can imagine the messing around that visual effects artists have to go through to get rid of those green guys, add the CGI in there, faking the interaction with them, and then having to line it all back up again to get it looking perfect. It's just a mess to do. And it takes ages, and it often doesn't result in the best looking outcome. And it's just not best for the actors either, because they're having to act against some guy in a green costume and not like a fellow actor who they can build on-screen rapport with. Whereas in Spider-Man 2's case, for all of these interactions, like Otto smoking the cigar with his claws, the real props could be used instead and massively simplify this entire process, which then freed up the visual effects department to go and focus their talents elsewhere where they're much better applied. And so stuff like this is kind of the broad strokes as to how these genuine prop arms helped keep the CGI consistently good looking. But these prop arms were so effective and provided so much value that you can even drill deep down into the minutiae of them and still see how they gave the visual effects artists a lot of different opportunities to make their CGI just look better and better. For example, for just stuff like a reference perspective alone, they now had hundreds of hours of footage of these real arms moving under the exact same lighting conditions they were going to put their CGI ones under. And so, unlike most films would ever, ever have, the visual effects artists now had something, these arms, that they could perfectly match their animation, reflections, shadows, color grades, and much, much more of their CGI arms against, which of course helped attain a much better result. Or another example of this, is how they could scan those real life props with all of their real life details into the computer as 3D models and then use these 3D models as the baseline for all of their CGI, causing their CGI to inherit all of the realistic details like scratches and dents that the real life props had and therefore causing it to look a lot more realistic as now it had the same weathering and grunginess as the real life prop had rather than being some perfect clean computer generated object that would just 
immediately stand out as wrong. So basically, there was just all of these tiny little different ways they could drip feed realism into these arms and just use this to keep the visual effects process as simple and easy as possible. Well, you know, as simple and easy as you can possibly make visual effects. Because I may have underplayed the sheer amount of effort that the visual effects artists also put into this project. As from a digital perspective, getting things like the CGI arms movement correct was just as much of a nightmare as doing it in real life for pretty much the exact same reasons, like nailing down his very unusual movement pattern, or just how complex he is with all of these different moving parts. And so basically by having so much of this CGI done for real, a lot of realism was just gifted to the visual effects team, essentially for free, and allowed them to reach that bar of realism so much easier. And I just don't know why films have stopped doing this, because it clearly provides so much value in all aspects, from visual quality, to character development, to storytelling ability. And the fact that we don't see this anymore is just a mystery, honestly. And so these claws having this perfect blend is already doing a lot of work to make this film's effects look great. But what's really interesting about Spider-Man 2, and what is pretty much the reason why the rest of this film's visuals have aged so gracefully, is that we can actually observe this perfect blend running throughout all of Spider-Man 2's visual effects to make it so that all aspects of this film look as consistently good as Otto does. Because, for example, stuff like the environments for these big comic book fight scenes were also absolutely crammed full of CGI, but because this film was edited in such a clever way, and because they also blended a bunch of practical and miniature sets into their CGI ones, it doesn't feel anything like the big CGI sludge fest we get nowadays. And in fact, this process here is so impressively done that it probably deserves its whole own entire video dedicated to discussing them. But in short, what this film does so well is constantly switch between shots that are loaded with CGI to shots which have little to none. And you can see this for yourself if you go back and watch any of the big comic book sequences from the Raimi trilogy. Each sequence is this revolving door of all of these different techniques, constantly swapping between practical effects and CGI. And therefore, because of this, just like with the arms, each technique gets the opportunity to be utilised in the exact right place at the exact right time, and therefore get used to its maximum potential. Because if you ever do have some CGI that looks bad, like Alfred Molina's digital double, which is probably one of the worst looking effects in this film, then you can constantly cycle that effect in and out and instead depend on things like his stunt actor or even close-ups of Alfred Molina's face. And so because of this, no one is really going to complain if every 1 in 10 CGI shots looks a little bit bad because that shot is being supported by everything else around it in the film. I mean, think about it. Who has ever really complained about Doc Ock's visual effects despite there being a bunch of bad shots in this film? You just don't hear it, because even in these highly CGI moments, there's still a lot of real elements bleeding their way through into it. But now, before we go on, something I just wanted to make clear is that despite going on about how impressive all of these real visual effects are, and how well they're spliced into the film, and just how good it all looks, this isn't supposed to be some video ripping on CGI and calling it rubbish and saying that we should all return to practical effects. But instead, what I'm trying to do here is highlight how both of these different aspects of filmmaking have their place. Because if this entire film was possible to do with just practical effects, then we'd already have seen it 20 years prior to Spider-Man 2, before computers got involved in any of this. But it turns out, if you're going to make a story about a guy who goes swinging off buildings and fighting giant octopus men, then you kind of need CGI. Otherwise, it ends up looking like, well, this. And so my point is basically just that the overuse of CGI is not the enemy in modern films, but where the problem lies is in the underuse of practical effects. And we'll get to that soon, don't you worry. However, there was just one more final thing I wanted to quickly touch on, because I think there's one final piece of the pie that really works to sell this practical and CGI blend so effectively. And that is just how well these effects were actually applied throughout this film because this film goes out of its way to make both Otto and his arms absolutely terrifying to the citizens of New York. And this really works wonders for the film's visual effects. Because Sam Raimi originally comes from a horror background, and that really bleeds into a lot of aspects in this film. But nowhere better can it be observed than in the hospital scene, where after Otto's experiment goes wrong, a bunch of doctors try to remove the arms from his unconscious spine. And in response to this, the arms begin to defend themselves, and let's just say it doesn't go 
know too well for Team Doctor. But what was really interesting about Raimi's approach to this scene is that despite this being the big reveal and the first time that we see Otto's arms being used for evil, the focus isn't really on them here. But instead, the focus is actually on these poor scientists who are getting brutally murdered, often tucking the visual effects arms away in the background and instead using horror film tropes like tension and release or just overemphasizing the brutal nature of all of this to shift the scene into being much more about its human elements and the performances of real actors than any kind of CGI spectacle. And so this not only reduces the screen time that the CGI arms need, but also it just makes the visual effects a lot less important to the success of this scene. Because it's not really about them, but instead it's about the suffering of these poor people and immersing you into this chaotic moment alongside them. And I mean, this might sound like a rather simple reason to praise the visual effects. Because yeah, every film is trying to immerse you. That's the entire point of them. But the difference here is that a lot of other films are trying to use these impressive, impossible effects moments as the primary way to stir emotions within you. Like trying to make us feel like how it would be to be that superhero and fly around or fight crime, which is great and often works really well. But it also means if those visuals do look bad, then they don't really have much else to offer us beyond that. And without any other emotional weight to any of this, things can fall flat really, really quickly. And so this is when things start to become CGI sludge, because you reach the point where the effects are starting to detract from the much more important narrative. Whereas this scene is using the emotions of the people to tell its story, and so it doesn't live and die by the quality of its visual effects, because they're only there to support a real human performance, rather than being the entire performance themselves. And so I'm not throwing shade at power reveal scenes for being overt and flashy or literally about the powers themselves, because that's often the exact point of them. And to be honest, they're often some of the best parts of this genre because of the pure spectacle of them. And I also want to make it clear that I'm not insulting the work of visual effects artists themselves when I describe any of this as sludge. In fact, I'm actually trying to say the complete opposite, that if CGI looks bad, it's often something that's actually happened upstream from their work, like crappy onset decisions or the choice very early in planning production to completely depend on CGI for something that really doesn't need it, or just general weak overall filmmaking direction. All of which are things we'll cover when we get to No Way Home. And so all I'm actually saying is that by making the visual effects a secondary part of this story, it just opens up a lot of wiggle room in CGI quality for us as the audience, because there's so much else for us to work with in this scene. And so even when there is the occasional dodgy piece of CGI, your critical brain isn't kicking in and stopping to ask, was that CGI? Because instead we're just fully swept up in the well-executed drama of all of this. And so once you start to notice this, you can actually begin to see this use of both horror tropes and making the arm secondary being leveraged all throughout this film to both keep us constantly swept up in the story, whilst also once again keeping the film focused on character above anything else. Because almost every time Otto appears within the city's limits, the film makes an effort to slowly build up that tension, usually by either showing people people's fearful reactions to Otto's stomping approach in that Jurassic Park style, or by just straight up displaying how the average citizen is actually insanely afraid of this guy. And this is such a good choice by the film, because by giving us this terrified window into the lives of just these normal people, it actually makes Otto feel like this very big deal who's terrorizing the citizens of New York, and not like just some random bad guy who's the fifth one to pop up this week. And this is so much better than when we just see hundreds of faceless civilians just get randomly killed like movies love to do nowadays, as even though we've only known these people for like just a few seconds, seeing them terrified like this gives them this really human element. And this actually creates some stakes in the story, because if it's just a bunch of faceless victims getting eradicated, then who are the heroes even supposed to be saving? If there's nothing human about this at all, then what even is there for us as the audience to be invested in with this story? And in fact, this whole concept of Otto being a genuine problem is actually so well tied into the narrative of this film, because with him being this problem, you can actually go and make a really plausible argument about why people would distrust Spider-Man when he's wrapped up in fighting this guy. Because I mean, there's a giant eight-armed crazed scientist stomping around the city slaughtering people, and Spider-Man's best plan is to go and punch him? No, let a SWAT team or the National Guard deal with him, is what some people might say. And so this, combined with the intense level of fear that we know all the citizens are feeling,
feeling comes together so well when Joey Diaz and the rest of the citizens on the train finally stand up to Otto as well. Because now we know just how much fear they're putting to the side to protect Spider-Man from him. And it just makes it such a rewarding moment for a lot of Peter Parker's character arc up until this point. Because now we finally get to see just how much his efforts are valued by the people of New York, despite what the news might make you think. And it really shows that his choice to give up what he wants and keep being Spider-Man is the correct one. And this all ties up really well when, in the end, Otto has to make the exact same choice. Sometimes, to do what's right, we have to be steady and give up the thing we want the most. And so, with all of this in mind, I really encourage you to, next time you sit down and watch Spider-Man 2, to start looking at just how well the different jigsaw pieces of this film come together, from the ways it's edited to obscure the CGI, to how the film consistently uses tension and presentation to keep you as immersed and wrapped up in it as possible. Because when you bundle all of these different techniques up with the fact that hundreds of very talented visual effects artists worked on this film for hundreds of hours and used the most cutting edge CGI tools they possibly could, to refine all of this animation and subtle movements down perfectly, then it's no wonder that this film came out looking fantastic. And it's nice to know that Spider-Man 2 has gone down so well, because if you look at the efforts of everyone involved, then it really, really deserves it. And so I suppose the major running theme throughout all of Spider-Man 2's visuals is that thanks to the effort of everyone involved, there was just so much less CGI on screen than most films would ever usually have. And when it was used, it was just used fantastically. And so, considering all of that, let's go almost 20 years into the future from Spider-Man 2 and check out Doc Ock's return in 2021's Spider-Man No Way Home and see whether they kept this perfect blend. So, did they? Well, if you haven't already guessed, they didn't. There was no more puppets. This time around, the arms were fully CGI. But to be fair, I'm actually kind of okay with this because CGI in general has gotten a lot more dependable than it was back in 2004. But more importantly, Alfred Molina is just a lot older now. And I doubt he wants to have 60 pounds of giant prop arms strapped to his back. But where this film did go a little bit too far, in my opinion, was using CGI for everything else in this sequence. Because yeah, they did actually do a lot of stuff in this sequence practically. They blew things up, they crushed cars, the new Spider-Man Tom Holland did some cool stunt work, and then they replaced most of that with CGI anyway. And because of this, at times, you can just tell that what you're looking at is a little bit of a cartoon. And that really isn't helped by the fact that Raimi's amazing direction isn't there, and that the film isn't nearly playing your emotions anywhere near as much as Spider-Man 2 did. And so once you just start to notice that a lot of this is CGI, it does really start to detract from the scene because you don't get that same sense of danger that you did with Spider-Man 2. But now, I don't actually want to go too hard on the CGI of this scene, because I think COVID played a big factor in a few of their choices for it. And at the same time, a lot of it is actually genuinely bloody fantastic, with stuff like the background being fully CGI and completely invisible, or stuff like the CGI double for Alfred Molina now basically being flawless and an obvious improvement over Spider-Man 2's, which I think was actually the biggest standout difference that I found in my recent of both of these films, and it kind of summed up the last 20 years of CGI growth for me. Because for Spider-Man 2, the creation of the CGI Digital Double Doc Ock was clearly a very big deal, as there were pages and pages of interviews about how exactly they did it, the struggles they ran into, how they overcame them. It just seemed to be both a massive challenge and a massive achievement for everyone involved. But conversely, for No Way Home, nowadays it's just treated as this very standard and normal thing that they just went and did as if it was just part of the job and at the same time the result that they output was 10 times better and so this just really highlights how far things have grown when it comes to cgi and how much more dependable it is nowadays that we're just able to go and make a digital double doc ock that looks fantastic no questions asked but at the same time i think this level of growth might have now given filmmakers too much freedom because something else that was heavily discussed in the behind the scenes of spider-man no way home was how the executives at Marvel were able to use the freedom of basically having a fully CGI scene to come in and make all the little tweaks they'd ever want, such as moving the camera around digitally, changing the lighting, and basically just restructuring everything in post as much as they wanted to. And whilst, again, this is actually really impressive that CGI has gotten this good, what this also does is kind of take the guardrails off whenever you film something in real life. Because like we said, in Spider-Man 2, they basically had to get those puppet arms looking perfect on set. But now 
nowadays, everything you don't like can just be changed, enhanced, or iterated over as many times as you want. And it's basically just opening Pandora's box, isn't it? Because that roughness around the edges of Spider-Man 2 is what gave it a large part of its charm. It just felt more real and authentic because it wasn't trying to be perfect. And therefore, in a way, it kind of was. And so I'm all for using CGI to create impossible visuals and tell amazing stories. But when you're using it to fix screw-ups that you could have just avoided on set or tweak tiny little problems or nitpick your footage, then I don't know if any of these are actually good enough reasons for me to want to be staring at a cartoon rather than a real film. And so basically, I guess what I'm saying is that with great power comes great responsibility. And so to conclude all of this, what No Way Home does is really help to further highlight just how perfect the balance that Spider-Man 2 had was. And it's just another reason why Spider-Man 2 is deservedly held in such high regard. But what do you guys think? Are there any films that struck as good a balance as Spider-Man 2 did? And how did you feel about Doc Ock's return in No Way Home? And speaking of absolute legends like Doc Ock, I just want to give a massive shout out to all of my Patreon subs. So thank you to Modern Adventurer, Matt Locke, Kyle Hofling, and an even bigger thank you to Rye Jones, Darren Birmingham, Lime, Ishita the Car on YouTube, and of course, the utter legend that is Darth Gader because this video was a massive research project that genuinely took me months to put together. And so knowing I had your support really enabled this video to reach the next level. So genuinely thank you again. But yeah, if you like this video and you, and you wanna see more deep dives into the best VFX of the last 20 years, then please let me know in the comments below, drop a like and subscribe. Oh, and we also have a Discord channel where we chat about a lot of this stuff too. So please check the link in the description for that as well. But otherwise, yeah, thank you for watching and have a great day.